Thank you, Jeff. And uh, it's wonderful to be back again. And again, with continuing to um, to see everybody via Facebook and Zoom. So uh, Shabbat Shalom, everybody. The first time I spoke, I called a generation celebration. We should celebrate these genealogies. And today we're gonna look at a message I'm calling Generation Confirmation. And you shall call his name Yeshua. And it actually ties very well into the parasha today. And he shall live. And um, why don't we read the Torah portion? And if you would turn to Genesis 49, but we also have it up here on the screen. Uh, very important to continue the idea of the generations. And Jacob summoned his sons and said, assemble yourselves so that I may tell you what will happen to you in the days to come. Gather together and listen, sons of Jacob. Yes, listen to Israel, your father. Reuben, you are the firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, uncontrollable as water. You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it, he went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brothers, their swords are implements of violence. May my soul not enter into their counsel. May my glory not be united with their assembly, for in their anger they killed men and in their self-will they leaned oxen. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cr cruel. I will scatter them in Jacob and disperse them among Israel. But as for you, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies, and your father's son shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's cub. From the prey, my son, you have gone up. He crouches, he lies down as a lion, and as a lion who dares to stir him up. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull from wine and his teeth white from milk. And now we have the half Torah portion taken from 1 Kings chapter 2, 1 through 4. And this has to deal with the preeminence of the line of Judah going all the way down to King David. As David's time to die drew near. He commanded his son Solomon saying, I am going the way of all the earth. So be strong and prove yourself a man. Do your duty to the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies according to what is written in the law of Moses so that you may succeed in all that you do and wherever you turn. So that the Lord may fulfill his promise which he spoke regarding me saying, if your sons are careful about their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, you shall not deprived of a man to occupy the throne of Israel. And then finally, we will finish up with the uh, Brit Hadashah reading taken from the gospel of Luke. <clears throat> now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, greetings favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Yeshua. He will be great and be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. 
and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Amen. Amen. Well, as I said, this continues our theme of the genealogies. And what we have today is we have an idea of that the genealogy, as we discussed the first time, started from Noah, went down to Noah. <coughs> Excuse me. Started from Adam, I'm sorry. Continued through Noah. Then it came to Abraham. Abraham had different sons. But today in Genesis chapter 49, we see it goes from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And it doesn't go through his first son, second son, or third son. But the royalty, the kingdom of the Jewish people will go through Judah. And then we see that when David um, is dying, he tells his son Solomon. And David had many sons too. But that the generations, the genealogy of the coming of the Messiah would go through David and Solomon. Last time we did read in the New Testament from Matthew, uh, the whole genealogy of when Jesus was born. So we're not going to do that again today, but we're going to focus on the generation confirmation that he has actually come. And we see that Gabriel, now Gabriel's the same angel that talked to Daniel about when exactly the Messiah would come. And maybe we can discuss that a little bit later on in our discussion after the service. But here, she was told by that same angel to talk to Daniel, you shall call his name Yeshua. Now, names say a lot about us. One, they probably tell people whether you're female or male. Okay. Um, you might be called Larry, and most people will know you're a male. You'll be called Mary. Most people know that you're a female. There are a few names, though, Leslie, Robin, Sydney, and Alex, that can go kind of both ways. Um, in our country, you know, names tell us actually the time that we might have been born. For example, in the early 1900s, did you know that John and Mary were twice as popular as any other names for male and female? Number one name for male John, number one for female Mary, probably because of many, many, many people going to church at that time. By the 1960s, John was third and Mary was third being taken over by Michael and Lisa. Now, maybe because of the uh, names being promoted in uh, songs at that time. Today, John is 18th on the list of males and Mary is 65th. So again, if you're named Mary, most likely you're from another generation. Names not only tell us who we are, but they tell us a story. Obviously, Abraham, Abram was changed to Abraham, the father of many nations. Just a little while ago, we read about Jacob's name being changed to Israel. And that's just like today, most of us who were circumcised and given the name and in the United States who were Jewish, we actually have two names. For example, my English name is Mitchell, but my Hebrew name is Moshe. So I carry two names as well. And if you're Jewish, uh, you might carry the same as, as me. Um, names not only tell us a little bit about who we are and what generation, but it's a Jewish tradition to name a child after somebody who died to kind of carry on their vision of the family, okay? We see this being played out in Luke, and I'll just read from 159 through 63. And it happened that on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. This is John. And they were going to call him Zacharias after his father. But his mother answered and said, no, indeed, but he shall be called John. And they said to her, there is no one among your relatives who is called by that name. 
and they made signs to his father as to what he should be called. And he asked for a tablet and wrote as follows. His name is John or in Hebrew, Yochanan. And they were all astonished. So we see from the New Testament that this idea of naming people after people in your family uh, was prevalent during the time of Yeshua. And now we have uh, an idea of when Yeshua was born, traditionally in the Christian church, because as they celebrate the birth of Jesus on December 25th, January 1st is traditionally the festival of the circumcision of Jesus when he got his name, okay? And uh, we see here uh, in our text today, you shall call his name Yeshua, you know, and many people might ask, why do we call him Yeshua? You know, uh, because in the, in the uh, I believe what Michael talked about last week from Isaiah, from Isaiah 7, the virgin shall give birth to a son and you shall call his name Emmanuel. Why wasn't he named Emmanuel? Well, the Isaiah also says that his name in 9, 6 shall be called Wonderful Counselor should be called Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Jeremiah says his name shall be called the Lord our righteousness. So the reality is the Messiah has many different names, but his human name will be called Yeshua. Why? Because in those names give a lot of identity to his genealogy. He's human. So he's got a very common name. And it means that he's a son of Joseph. He is royalty. He's from that tribe of David, and Yeshua will show us that his name is royalty. And then finally, his name shows us that he's divine and that he's the son of God. So let's continue in our teaching today uh, about the first one. His name shows he is the son of Joseph, humanity, okay? And if you have your scriptures, uh, we're going to turn to Luke chapter 2, verse 21. <clears throat> and when eight days had passed, before his circumcision, his name was then called Yeshua, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. So we saw that Gabriel told him to name him Yeshua. And they did on the eighth day. That's when Jewish boys get their name and why is why is this important why is it important that his name is called yeshua well because the reality is is that it shows that he's jewish and it shows that he um in a sense is carrying on the traditions um of every jewish person at that time joseph is jewish and Mary is Jewish. So it's tradition that on the eighth day, you circumcise your son. And they gave him a very common name. Yeshua was not a special name. It was the name that the angel told him to give him. But it represents the fact that he's human. He followed all of the Jewish laws that were maintained in the scriptures. And if we turn to the next slide, we can see that in Genesis 17, 11 through 12, and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you, and every male among you who is eight days old shall be circumcised through all your generations. So we see that, in a sense, he was just a common Jewish person, Jewish boy at eight days old, just like everybody else. Okay, and the, the idea of his name, we call him Yeshua, but that's just kind of a shortened name for Yehoshua, Joshua. My son is named Joshua, but his Hebrew name is Yehoshua. But at that time, just like John is short for Jonathan, Yeshua is just the shortened version of Yeshua. Okay, the name Yeshua occurs 27 times in the Hebrew scriptures, primarily referring 
to the high priest after the Babylonian exile that we can read in Zechariah. And more frequently, um, we saw that Yeshua uh, person shows up in, um, uh, in Ezra. So Yeshua's name was not unusual. In fact, as many as five different men had that name in the Old Testament. And this is how that name came to be Jesus in English. There's some controversy over is Jesus a name? Should we use Yeshua? Well, the reality is, is that Jesus is just the English version of the name Yeshua. Okay. And so uh, whatever you call him, uh, we know his Hebrew name was Yeshua. The world might know him as Jesus. And the reality is, is that he came into the world very common we just being born like everybody else. And it's amazing that his life started off drawing blood because the circumcision, the Brit Milah means to, to cut and to draw blood. He's cut into the Jewish people. Later on, we'll see that he, he in his death, there was another Brit, another cut of him giving his blood for us. So amazing that he comes into the world and the first ceremony is this Brit Mila. Next slide, please. The second ceremony that we're going to see represents the fact that he's the son of David in a kind of an obscure way, but if you'll follow me, um, I hope you'll, you'll see, okay? Uh, next slide as we continue reading in the Gospel of Luke. And when the days for purification, according to the laws of Moses, were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to pre present him to the Lord. As, is, as it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn meal that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. So we see here there's two ceremonies that are kind of linked together. But um, the, the first one that has to be done before the days of purification, um, the parents of Yeshua decided to do both together. A circumcision took place at, at home after eight days, most likely in the city of Bethlehem. Okay, after the days of purification come, they go up into the temple and we see the fact that they do that purification ceremony also along with this Pidyan Haben. And I believe Michael talked about that last week. So I'm not gonna go into it uh, quite a bit other than the fact that is I wanna kind of link it to the genealogies, okay? Every firstborn meal that opens the womb shall be called holy to the world, okay? What is this redemption of the firstborn, okay? Well, um, if you turn to the next slide, please. Okay, um, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel when the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had be revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Yeshua to carry out for him the custom of the law, this Pidyan Haben, then he took him in his arms and blessed God and said, as we continue, now the Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to part in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all people, a light of the revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. See, not only does the Messiah have many different aspects of his name, he has many different aspects of what he's going to do when he comes. He's a savior. He's salvation. My eyes have seen your salvation. Well, many people say, well, how come we don't see the name of Jesus in the Old Testament? Well, it's very simple. Jesus is an English name. We don't see English, but if you read the Hebrew, the idea of salvation in the Old Testament, the root word is Yeshua. Salvation. It actually means it's two words, Yeshua. Salvation or return is from the Lord. 
So his name not only represents the fact that he's a common Jewish person, his goal is when he's come is he will bring people back to the Lord. It's one of the goals of the Messiah. The Messiah is coming to save his people. Now, obviously, um, Simeon was looking for the consolation, the one who would console the Jewish people when he comes. We know all the way back from the garden, and as we continue, the idea of the Messiah when he comes would be like a Noah type, one who would console us, uh, bring us comfort. In fact, the rabbis say one of the names of the Messiah will be called Nachem, um, one who would comfort us from the curse of the ground that the Lord had caused. So we see that, in a sense, he is understanding of his role. He's coming to save his people, which is one of the roles and ideas of the Messiah. But how does this tie into the pity and haben? Well, the fact that he's firstborn shows us that he has the right to take on the role of the Messiah, the king. Why? Because we see that David passed on his kingship to Solomon, and from there, we see that there's a whole genealogy of, for the most part, the firstborn of each generation having the right to rule after their father. Now, Pity and Haben shows us that Yeshua is the firstborn of Joseph. There was no other child born to Mary and Joseph before that. So Joseph had the right to pass on his kingship to his firstborn, which in this case is Yeshua. Uh, it's very important, too, because the idea of pity and haben means that he wasn't a priest. You can't be king and priest at the same time within the Jewish world. Okay, You get your Jewishness from your mother, but you get your role of how you're going to serve God from your father. So, for example, if you want to be a priest, you must be, uh, have a father who is a Kohen or a Levite, and that's passed down from generation to generation. The idea of priests and Levites and Kohans do not have to do pity and haben because they're actually serving in place of the, um, um, of, of the firstborn. So the idea that Yeshua is firstborn is very important. He has the right to take the kingship. He has the right to be the son of David coming down from his father. Okay. And then finally, we see that his name not only represents that he's human and that he's royalty, but that he also is divine. And that's very important because this is kind of the, the missing piece. Okay. I have a chessboard here because to be the messiah you have to be born in a certain place you have to have the right genealogy both your mother and father have to be jewish you have to be from the tribe of david but there's a kind of a hidden piece here and this is what i want to kind of finish my message off to you today as we continue along with um he goes up to uh, the temple with his mom they have the pity and haben with simeon saying Wow, Lord, I can die now because you have told me I won't die until I've seen your Messiah. And he's embracing it. What a wonderful time for Simeon. But there's another person who shows up that, again, gives us some kind of prophecy. So as we continue on in Luke, if you would turn to the next slide, please. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. And Simeon blessed him and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel, and for a sign to be opposed, and a sword will pierce even your own soul, to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. We have this idea now of, hey, here's the Messiah. Simeon's very happy about it. His mother and father were amazed of all the things that were said. But then he says, hey, many kingdoms are going to fall and rise, and the sword will pierce even your own soul. Imagine their displeasure, seeing their son die on the cross. Well, I shouldn't say they, because 
you know, after kind of the initial time of Jesus's birth, we don't see Joseph around anymore because of the scriptures are kind of um, blank. Um, where is Joseph? So we just assume that he died. But his mother, we know, is at the cross watching her son die. Wow, that must have been very, very unhappy time for her because obviously if you're the Messiah, you got to live. You're going to defeat your enemies. And imagine that Simeon is telling her before the events that this event will happen and you're going to be very sad. And she might have gone back to this prophecy from Simeon. However, as we continue, another person shows up in the temple. And this is a, a woman. So um, next slide, please. And um, <clears throat> they're going up to the purification ceremony. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, uh, next, next slide. Uh, next slide. I got a little mixed up here, I'm sorry. And his name shows that he's the son of God, he's divine. Okay, um, next slide. <clears throat> and they needed to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Okay, okay, next slide. And there was a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phineal of the tribe of Asher. She was advanced in years and had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage. And then as a widow to the age of 84, she never left the temple serving night and day with fasting and prayer. At that very moment, she came up and began giving thanks to God and continued to speak to him, to all of those who were looking for the redemption. Oh, there's something blocked. Oh, okay. The redemption of Jerusalem. So again, we see here that Simeon's looking for salvation. She's looking for redemption. And redemption is more of a kind of a term used more in the sacrificial system where salvation is used more of a bringing back people to the Lord. Yes, bringing back to the land, bringing them back kind of uh, positionally, but now redemption. Redemption is a idea that now is gonna be introduced to the Messiah, okay? Mary is going up because when Amazing, the most important thing that you do as a, as a woman when you're married is to give birth. But unfortunately, that, that wonderful, wonderful experience causes you to be unclean. Imagine, I, I know that there is many here that probably come from a Catholic background and you have a whole idea of Mary and all of that based on some stuff that was said to the angel to her that she would be called like the most blessed. I'm not an expert on the immaculate conception, but I know one thing, if you look at it from a Jewish perspective, it doesn't really fit. Why? Because yes, she was given the unbelievable honor of giving birth to God in the flesh. But even though she was given that right, it still made her unclean. She still had to go up to the temple after 66 days and clear clean herself up from being stained from giving birth. You know, why? I'm not sure why. I've looked at different commentaries on why it's twice as long for this ceremony to happen for girls than boys. Why we even do it? Um, because you're giving birth. The first commandment in the Bible is to be fruitful and multiply. The rabbis are not, not necessarily in... Um, agreement on to why this whole ceremony even takes place, other than the fact that, you know, that in childbirth, there would be, in a sense, this is maybe the role of Eve and, and the whole idea of the um, eating the forbidden fruit. So it's one of the judgments against, uh, against uh, the female about giving birth. However, I'm not going to go into that today, because I'm not an expert on that, other than the fact that the fact that she was given the honor of giving birth to the Messiah and that he would be a common Jewish person. He would be from the tribe of David, but now she's giving birth to the Messiah who would be 
God in the flesh. Nobody really had an idea that this was going to happen. And it was through this prophecy that this woman tells Joseph and Mary that what's inside of you, what was inside of you was so special that when he's born, it doesn't make you any different. You're still the same person. They even had doubts. They were not sure what was going on. And yes, miraculously, through giving him the birth of the Messiah, Mary is considered unclean. She goes up and she has to give a sacrifice of two turtle doves, which shows that the family was quite poor because normally you would bring an animal much larger, but even if you were poor, you could bring two turtle doves. Shows you that Yeshua was born into just not even a common home, a very poor home. Okay, but here's the amazing thing that God decides to come into the world to be born. And this is the, the hidden piece of the genealogy that, you know, there's a, as we talked last time, there is a curse on the line of David, the curse of Jack and Aya that we discussed. And how do you get around it? You have to have a virgin birth foretold in the garden, foretold last week when Mike preached on Isaiah 7, 14, the idea that God would come in the flesh, but through the birth of um, the virgin birth is very special. And it's a sign to the world that he's not just human. He's not just uh, uh, royalty. He is divine. Why is that important? for him to carry out the most important thing that he's going to do. Because the last thing he does is bring in the new covenant. And every covenant needs bloodshed. There's bloodshed at the beginning of his birth, and there's bloodshed at the end of his birth. Why? Because he's bringing in a new covenant that he would redeem us from our sins. His first, covenant, his first coming was all about him coming to redeem us, to redeem us spiritually. When he comes back, we'll be part of his kingdom physically. But right now, this is the most important part of his name. Yeshua means that he was a common Jewish person. Yeshua means that he has the right to save people. He is from the tribe of David. But more importantly, Yeshua means God saves. God saves us. We can't save ourselves. And that's... Um, the end of the message today. The idea that his name, you shall call his name.